Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this amazing interview. I've been looking forward all week to speaking to Faraz Zahabi. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, very good. Uh, amidst a very severe lockdown here in Quebec, but uh, other than that, alhamdulillah, very good. And how are you in terms of like you've got a lot of training to do? I'm sure in a day you're probably burning a lot of calories. So how are you managing all of that? Well, it's very difficult during the lockdown. So, uh, you know, we're managing as best we can, but um, it's very limited. Yeah. Um, are you finding that people are getting a little bit like a lot of people in the UK? I mean, I'm sure in the comments as well, they'll say that people are putting on weight. Some people are getting <laughs> depressed. Um, I mean, gyms are closed and it's very difficult. I mean, some people are just turning their garages into gyms and stuff. So what's it like in your neck of the woods? Well, you Training alone is not as fun, you know, it's not the same environment. So I always say training is all about motivation. So when you're in the gym, it's far more motivating. It's, uh, you know, you're in a group setting. People are doing it together. It's just a lot more energy. Uh, it's a lot more, it's a lot more uh, fun. It's, mm. it's, it's just a different type of experience. When you're doing it alone, you can get away with it a few times, but after a while, it gets kind of boring, you know? Yes, it's just, yes, it's yes. just you and, and, and the weights or you and uh, the calisthenics. It's just kind of boring. So I always tell people motivation is everything when it comes to training. You know, it's really the heart of training. Mm, absolutely. And, and that group motivation is key because you're obviously surrounded by people who are you know, when you're running out of motivation, they're pushing you, and yeah, you know, it's it's so. fun to share the suffering, but when you're doing it alone, it's not it's not as fun. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. So this this particular topic, I mean, firstly, um, I think it's worth uh, repeating again um, why we're speaking about this particular topic and what your interest is, because you speaking on this live stream and the title being "Randomness: The Atheist Idol." I mean, people would see you as, you know, a uh, a world-renowned MMA coach and, you know, all of that. But they don't really know you for, you know, tackling these deep philosophical ideas. So just give give us a little, uh, a little bit of history in terms of uh, why you're interested in this, what you studied at university and why you're still, I mean, you have no financial incentive to do this. You have no, um, you know, you've, you're, you're, you're pretty busy, but why would you take out your time and speak about this topic? Uh, well, you know, I uh, I got my bachelor's from Concordia in philosophy, but that was really just the beginning of my uh, uh, philosophy training. You know, I study philosophy every single day for hours a day. You know, I study every every type of human thinking. It's really a, a passion of mine, a calling of mine. And it's not something I talk about very much. It's something that I do for myself personally because I'm very intrigued by what is true. I have this deep desire to know what is true and it's a very uh, it's a very unpopular question you know it's not something that people are very interested in uh, generally speaking Ge people i think as they get older get more and more interested but people in my age group are not as interested you know they're more uh, enamored by the body and uh, what is more immediate okay but since i'm very very young i was always very intrigued with the idea of what is true what is reality what what is the world uh, you know what is this world we live in i had these you know very uh, um, profound ideas in my mind, and I exercise them as I got older. Now, I I don't go to, I didn't continue university after my bachelor because my career is so demanding. You know, I'm, I'm literally in the gym, let's say eight hours a day. But at home, I spend a lot of time every day studying and reading and, and thinking and uh, listening to lectures. I have a very, very uh, deep passion for philosophy, logic, what is rational. And uh, I would consider myself a philosophy, uh, a, a philosopher of religion, a philosopher of epistemology, and a, a philosopher of any type of human thought. And, you know, of course, there are very popular ideas out in the world, but uh, even the most, even the most uh, experienced uh, experts in their field, they're not necessarily philosophers. So they make, oftentimes you'll hear an expert in a certain field make philosophical errors, glaring philosophical errors. Yeah. And uh, one of them is uh, the idea of randomness. Okay, and randomness, you know, as Pierre Simon Laplace would tell you, okay, he's known as the French Newton. He's a, he's a master of physics. He would tell you, look, randomness is a byproduct of the imagination. Now we have many philosophers who would tell you this: uh, Immanuel Kant, Ghazali. Uh, they would all agree that that randomness is a byproduct of ignorance. Okay. If you see the, if we, when we look at the world, especially after Newton, okay, when we look at the world, we see a clockwork universe. 
Now, the first person to say, to, to coin the term clockwork universe is actually Imam Ghazali. So this is a very Muslim idea as well, okay? Imam Ghazali likened the universe to a water clock. Uh, have you, are you familiar with a water clock? Yep. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar, there's a, there's a reservoir of water with a hole. The water lets, uh, excuse me, the hole lets the water out gently. There's a ball floating on top of the water. As it sinks down, it pulls a cord. When, it pulls, when the cord is pulled, it triggers, it pulls down an inclined plane. When the inclined plane is triggered, a ball rolls down, connects, uh, and collides with some chimes, and makes a sound. Mm. That's how the Arabs knew it's time to pray. Okay, they created a water clock. A water clock is just a chain reaction of events. Yep. One event triggering another until the ball hits the chimes, and when the chimes are struck, the Muslims know it's time to pray. Mm. Ghazali said, look at the water clock. He said, the universe is like a water clock. Yep. And the first event, Aristotle's unmoved mover, the first one to start this tr to trigger the first chain reaction is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah triggered this chain reaction. Now, later on, um, uh, Descartes agreed with Ghazali. He said, look, the world is clockwork. It's one event triggering another. For instance, me and you right now are sitting here talking because of events that happened in the past. Your yeah. parents met, my parents met, and they met because of events that happened in their past. And there's this chain reaction of events, and here we are today talking. And the words we're saying today, the things we're doing, are going to influence the future. Yep. Now, a human being who has a, any, an entity who has all the information, this is what Pierre Simon Laplace would tell you. If you, had, if you had the velocity of every atom in the universe, the direction velocity of every atom in the universe, you could tell where every other atom in the universe is going to be in the future. Because if you could, it's, it's a, a predictable mathematical problem, like billiard balls on a table. Yeah. If I set up the billiard balls and I strike them at a particular angle and velocity, a physicist can tell me where every billiard ball is going to be. Yep. At every strike. So we ask now, what is this force of randomness? Randomness occurs when the variables are too great for a human mind to compute. Yeah. So then we have this illusion, Kant tells us, of randomness. But really, randomness is not there. It's a byproduct of our ignorance. If our ignorance was not the case, if our, if our intellect was elevated to that of a god, nothing would seem random to us. Actually, everything would seem predictable. Yeah. There would be no twists and turns in our lives. It would, it would, they wouldn't be shocking or surprising. There would be no drama. We would see things coming a mile away. So randomness is a byproduct. So for instance, I was watching a... What, how is this relevant? The world is clockwork. It's a chain reaction. It obeys the laws of Newton, the laws of motion. It could all be explained. Laplace says, even the atom in your hand, if you give me its velocity, I could tell you where your hand is going to be in five years. But yeah. then you'd ask Laplace, what about my human decision? He'd be like, no, that's all clockwork as well. All the way all your decisions are made by these, this chemistry in your brain. Everything is reduced to physics and chemistry. Chemistry also is just billiard balls on the pool table bouncing around. It's all chain reaction, so to speak. Yeah. The causal chain is complete. Now, in Islam, we are very deterministic. I don't know how any look, I'm not a theologian, but I'm a philosopher of religion. I don't know how anybody can read the Quran and say, we are not deterministic. Determinism is heavily propagated in the Quran. Yep. So the atheist is deterministic. The Muslim is deterministic. We are very, we're aligned here where there's no disagreement. Right? The disagreement comes when they say that there are random mutations, and these random mutations are literal. The word random is literal. So let me give you a for instance, okay? Uh, because I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm going to take the words of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay? Neil deGrasse Tyson said in a documentary, I watched one of his documentaries, and he said, look, there's this brown polar bear, uh, excuse me, a brown bear. And there was a genetic mutation. So he gave birth, they gave this couple of bear, this uh, mama bear gave birth to a white bear. This white bear now had an advantage in the snow. He had an advantage. And thus comes the polar bear. Down the line, you have a polar bear. This yeah. polar bear, because he's white, he's camouflaged in the snow, he found an environment where he excels, and he's going to propagate his genetics. I have no problem with this. Me, personally, I have no problem with this. My cosmology is identical with Ghazali's. Ghazali's Ghazali would have no problem with this. The Muslims of old would have no problem with this. Where they would have a problem, where I would have a problem as well, is they say that that mutation was random. It's an error. 
when you say that that mutation is an error, now you're taking a human narrative and placing it on what is observed. Science is not to add a narrative to what is observed. Science, if you understand the philosophy of science, science only explains the patterns and regularities found in nature. That's it. It doesn't do anything more. Yep. Science is there to explain, not excuse me, not to explain, to identify, not explain, to identify the patterns and regularities found in nature. Okay, so we see that this sequence is written. It's being copied over and over again. And here, in this time, in this one occurrence, there's a change in the sequence. You, with your human intentions, claim that that's an error. But that is a projection. That is you painting. That is you adding your color, your perspective, your narrative, that that is an error. Now, how could a blind process, because they believe in a blind process, how could a blind process make an error? It has no intention. So you're either saying a blind process had intention, which it, it's contradictory to the term blind process, or you're saying Allah made an error, God made an error. Either is, is faulty. God cannot make an error by the definition. Yep. And a blind process has no intention, so it's there cannot be an error. You're taking your human interpretation. This is where philosophers are going to object. We're going to say that that's an narrative. It, excuse me, that is a narrative. It is not observation. Yeah. There is no scientific experiment to test whether that intention was, was there or not. No. We're asking you, just tell us the hard facts. The hard facts is there was a change in genetic uh, writing. Observe that change, note it down, but don't tell us it was an error. When you say it's an error and it's done by randomness, now you're bringing a human interpretation. Now, this is actually a very interesting story in the Quran. You know the story of Khidr alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam. Yeah. We don't have the totality of evidence. So Musa he goes on an adventure with Khidr alayhi salam and he sees, he interprets the same events very differently. Khidr alayhi salam, he has all, he has the totality of evidence of what's going on in these events. He is correct. Musa is incorrect in his interpretation. The Quran right. is telling you, look, if you don't have the totality of evidence, your conclusions are illusionary or faulty. Yeah. If we had the totality of evidence, if we knew, like Laplace said, the velocity of every atom in the universe, if we, we had a perfect controlled experiment, we wouldn't see that as an error anymore. We only see it as an error because we're viewing it from a limited human perspective. Yeah. A great example of this is the catapult uh, uh, mind experiment. Before you get to the catapult yeah. uh, experiment, and that's a really interesting one to... Uh, uh, as a way to just think about science and the scientific method in, uh, in practice, your uh, point, what if a biologist like, say, Stephen Jay Gould, they responded to you and said, well, you see, we are at a point right now in terms of uh, the way human beings are, the way fish are, the way that um, all of the biosphere has the life that it has. However, he gives the example, Stephen Jay Gould gives the example of the good old VHS tapes that we used to have back in, you know, many years ago, those black ones. So we used to rewind those tapes and then replay them. And he used to make that sound and used to play and he used to play the same film. So he would say that, well, if we rewind the tape of evolution, rewind the tape of life and restart again, mm -hmm. we will have a different trajectory. And if we were to rewind it again and replay, we would have a different trajectory. And then we would have an infinite number of trajectories. And our trajectory as it stands right now, and human beings existing, because on most of the other trajectories, you'll have far more bizarre things than human beings. Human beings may never appear, according to him, mm -hmm. if we rerun it. And mm -hmm. therefore, his argument would be, this gives us an additional challenge to theology, because human beings are no longer special. They were not decreed but rather they are just incidental in terms of one evolutionary trajectory, which could, which is one of an infinite amount. How would you respond to that um, argument of his, and especially where he uses that okay. That's challenge a, exception? I, I believe his position is nonsensical, and here's why. Okay. What force does he attribute these fluctuations to? What force is it? Randomness. Where Random is it? Okay, where, where, where is it? Can you put it in test tube for me? Well, uh, he where, where, where did he observe it? Where did he observe randomness? That's my question. What scientific experiment did he bring up about to prove the existence of random, randomness? Well, the, uh, the evidence that they think they have is that 
when you have a uh, copying error, right, mm -hmm. then that particular error, we don't know whether that's going to be beneficial or detrimental to the organism. Uh -huh. And because mm -hmm. it's, we don't know whether it's going to be beneficial or detrimental, therefore that error is from a, a, a is fitness um, unspecified. We don't know whether it's going to enhance fitness. Correct. Or, or it, does it have a fitness value or not? We don't know. Yes. So therefore, okay. they, that's the randomness. That's okay, but randomness. is it is it knowable? If you had the intellect of God, is it knowable? No. Nope. Of course <laughs> it is. Well, so, sorry, sorry. Um, if you so, had the intellect of God, it would be obvious to you. No, but so, sorry. What I mean just is, like what? just like one physicist, if I hit the if I hit the billiard balls on a table, okay. So let, let a me physicist just can predict where every billiard ball is going to be. Yeah. So Hence sorry, we're in a clockwork universe. What, what he would say to your question, would God know? He would say, I don't believe in God. Okay, but that's irrelevant. Okay. I'm asking you if you had if you had all the knowledge in the, possible, if you had the totality of evidence. Yeah. If you had a, a divine intellect, my only I'm not saying does a divine intellect exist. I'm saying if you had a divine yeah. intellect, yes. that's a very valid question. Yeah. Would you know? The answer is yes. Mm. Hence, randomness is a byproduct of ignorance. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Me and you were watching a, a pool, a pool game, you know, billiard balls. Bleak, you know, I'm a layman, you're an expert in physics. Right. We hit the billiard balls, the billiard balls scatter across the table. Me, the layman, I say, look, it was all random. They went every which way and there was, there was no uh, rhyme or reason. Mm. And you say, no, you only think that because you're a layman, you're ignorant of physics. If you understood physics, you would see that they went precisely, infinitely precise to where they are today. They, it was inevitable they're going to go there. As a matter of fact, this is provable. Okay, we can prove this. This is, this is not a question of uh, uh, specula spe speculation. Those billiard balls landed precisely. To the layman, it looks like there's no rhyme or reason. That's a projection of my ignorance. Now I'm telling you, see the whole world as a, a billiard ball table. This is what Pierre Simon Laplace is asking you. This is what Razel is asking you. He's saying, look, look at the whole world as one giant uh, game of billiards. Randomness is only because it's an illusion of the mind because you're not able to compute all these differences. You don't have, you can't, you can't, you don't have a perfect control. However, if we rewinded the universe, if we rewinded it, yeah. it would play out exactly the same. Mm. Exactly. And this is not me saying this. This is, a, this is an atheist materialist philosophers will tell you this. If, because uh, this gentleman Gould, you're saying, doesn't understand determinism. Okay, Determinism is the antithesis of chance or, or ran randomness. There exactly. is no randomness in determinism. Determinism is the opposite of randomness. Everything is clockwork. Clockwork. It's like it would, it would like be it, it would it's the equivalent of saying clocks are random. No, clocks are not random. Clocks are precise, and so is the universe. Now, l let me give you the catapult experiment, be, uh, mind experiment, and then you could tell me how Gould would would get around this. Okay, because there are some people who disagree. Okay, there are. It does exist. Okay, we, uh, philosophers were never were rarely unanimous on an idea. But I'll tell you something. Uh, when it comes to determinism, yeah. they say you either agree with us or you don't understand it. Yeah. And believe me, there are many great thinkers out there that just simply don't understand determinism. Okay, mm -hmm. Now, look, let's look at the catapult experiment. We've talked about it before. I fire a catapult. I fire a projectile. And the projectile lands on point A. Now, we're going to repeat this experiment. But in this experiment, we have perfect control. The catapult is going to be reset I, exactly. Every molecule of air is going to be reset exactly. Every blade of grass on the ground that it landed on is going to be reset exactly. Every heavenly body is going to be reset exactly. I'm giving you a perfect control. When I refire this projectile again, is it going to land on point A or on a different point? Same point. It would have to. If you say it's a different point, then take all your science experiments and throw them in the trash because there's this mysterious force out there that yeah. can alter our results always. There's this phantom out there. If you say point A, then where is this force randomness that Mr. Gould here is, is appealing to? Yeah. Where is it? Now, I'm not saying that certain philosophers don't agree. Some philosophers will tell you, look, it'll land around the same area, but not exactly. And when we ask them why, they, they just make sounds with their, their mouths. They never actually give an explanation. They just, they, they just psychologically cannot agree. Just, there's a psychological grip, 
sometimes on our mind. Or the emotions get the best of us. But the truth of the matter is, if our experiments are true, if our, exper if our scientific experiments are true, we, if the laws of motion are true, if physics is true, it lands on point A every time, infinitely precise. Mm -hmm. If my controls are infinitely precise. Now, I'm not saying I can recreate an experiment twice infinitely precise. I'm saying, hypothetically speaking, if we did, it would land on point A. Hence, we live in a clockwork universe. Hence, the reason why you believe in, the, the reason why you experience randomness is actually a byproduct of the mind. You're projecting it onto what you're observing. Any master of Kant, anybody who's mastered Kantian philosophy would understand this. But physicists don't necessarily study Kant. Yep. And it's, it's very interesting what you pointed out earlier that you can have a brilliant mind like Stephen Jay Gould, who is considered one of the best biologists of the last couple of decades. Uh, he's written, you know, the structure of evolutionary theory, which is like a landmark book. Yet he gets the basics wrong, like you pointed out that he is an atheist but he doesn't understand the implications of atheism. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that particular point, which he was using um, to say that you can have many different uh, trajectories and um, very interesting, um, uh, very interesting figures who, who try to use biology to speak about theology and use the fact that uh, Gould used these types of arguments and these types of arguments are rife within evolutionary field to actually say, therefore, human exceptionalism and the idea that human beings are, 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 are supposed to be here is total nonsense because they say, well, if we had a different evolutionary trajectory, it would not exist. So, I mean, you, you smash that idea totally. However, what if somebody turns around and says, for us, you know what? Brilliant explanation. I totally get it. Randomness doesn't exist for, from a biological perspective. It's just a semantical issue. However, isn't it the case that um, in quantum mechanics, that you can have, uh, you know, observer bias, you can have particles that exist and don't exist at the same time. So, you know, isn't it possible? And I actually, uh, I remember going over something like this when I was studying philosophy, that, you know, some people try and make this argument that actually determinism can be challenged by quantum mechanics. H how would you respond to that? Well, I'll tell you something. I believe in, I believe in dualism and category. Okay, so I believe there are two types. There's the there's the outer world. There's the world of objects. Look around. There's objects everywhere. My body is an object. Yes, your yeah. body's an object. This computer is an object. This microphone is an object. There's this outer world, this seen world. Let's we call it the seen world, the world you observe. Yeah. And then there's this unseen world, a parallel world, of the world of uh, quali, um, subjective experience. This world is a private world. I can't see your private world and you cannot see my private world. Mm -hmm. You agree? There's this type of dualism we exist in. Yep, yep. I'm talking about the seen world. Yeah. Quantum mechanics is unseen. The unseen world, the jury is still out. There's a, the, the paradigm is still being formed. It's early to say. I believe that these two worlds are not contradictory because I'm experiencing, the, experiencing, them, experiencing them both at the same time. Mm. We have to, we're looking for a theory to make them both compatible because we're certain of both of them. Yep. However, I agree that the unseen world may behave very differently. However, my point, my point is that quantum theory and quantum physics is still out. It, it, the paradigm is still out. We're still learning about it. And it doesn't mean because it's, it may be different that it contradicts the seen world. There, there are there are theories to gel them together. We could talk about occasionalism. We could talk about pre-established harmony. We could talk about different worldviews that harmonize the two. Yeah. But what I cannot accept is that the world is only reducible to uh, materialism and uh, and uh, physics and chemistry. Okay. The, the, the atheistic materialist worldview is one that I reject because it flies in the face of my internal experience. So for instance, like a, a character like Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett, he says, he wrote, conscious, he wrote a book called Consciousness Explained. Yeah. He denies the inter internal world. He says, look, the internal world is illusionary. Why? Philosophers make fun of him for saying this. You know, they rename his book Consciousness Denied. He just basically denies consciousness. Explained the way, yeah. It, it, the consciousness explained the way he's basically saying look you don't have this internal experience but i'm having this internal experience when i'm reading your book i'm having mm -hmm. cognition 
he's writing a book for zombies. You know, John, uh, John Searle says, oh, are you a philosophical zombie? Is that what you are? Like, there's no internal experience when you wrote the book. You know, machines don't have an internal experience. They follow an algorithm. You know, if you could build a perfect robot, remember the robot experiment we did, the thought experiment once. Robots don't have cognition. They follow an algorithm. Because he presupposes materialism, everything is physics and chemistry, everything. When he, when, he, when he discovered something, when he came across something that cannot be reduced to physics and chemistry, i.e. the consciousness, he just flat out denies it. Hmm. Because his worldview, the place where he starts, cannot compute, or cannot, it doesn't have a, a place for it. Hmm. So what I'm telling you is, look, science, physics and chemistry is not absolute. There are things outside of physics and chemistry. I yeah. believe in free will. FYI, look, I'm a hard determinist like Ghazali, but I also believe in free will like Ghazali. Okay, so I don't want you to, I don't want to say I don't believe in free will. We'll, we'll have a, we should have a discussion on that in the future. We should agree that, you know, Muslims are hard determinists, but at the same time, we have free will. Now, materialist philosophers like Dennett deny free will. They deny personal experience now the quran answers them in in this uh in the, you know this 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 is true atheism because if you're truly an atheist because you know you can have a materialist philosopher who says look i don't deny conscious thought i just can't explain it i just don't equate it it's the hard problem of consciousness yeah. I, I it doesn't even well, i have no explanation for it yeah okay i give up but atheists like daniel dennett understand that their worldview necessitates yes that you deny it why? Because if materialism is absolute, that means physics, everything is physics and chemistry. And if consciousness is not physics and chemistry, you have to deny its existence. Because if it exists, it flies in the face of your philosophy, of your worldview. I'll give you a, a beautiful quote from uh, Thomas Huxley, which I'm sure you know very well. Yeah. He says, look, <laughs> consciousness to materialist philosophy is the equivalent of rubbing a lamp and getting a magic genie. It's the truth because how did we get from sticks and stones? How did we get consciousness? You know, how did we get from, how do we move from material, dead, lifeless material? Yeah. You can arrange them in the most complex manner you like. Yeah. Go ahead. Let me give you a, an infinite amount of sticks and stones and build the, the most complex structure, the most complex chain reaction of events. You can have valves, water rushing, uh, electrical components. Go ahead, build the most complex structure you want. At what point will those sticks and stones turn into an idea? Yeah. There's an ontological leap. There's a leap in nature. There's a leap and in, and in, and in, there's a different of kind. This is what John Searle he he critiques Daniel Dennett and he said, "Look, you're making a categorical error. You're going from sticks and stones." And now we're talking about mind, not brain. We're talking about mind. And you're saying that mind doesn't exist because of these sticks and stones. Huxley even rejects him. Of course, Huxley existed before. He says, look, it's the equivalent of saying, I rubbed this lamp and a magic genie occurred. Now, the magic genie is nothing. He's not of the same nature as the lamp. How do you explain consciousness? How do you explain first-person experience? through sticks and stones it's it's impossible now here's another very important issue the because it's in my view you either believe in god or you believe in magic genies take your pick hmm. it's it's either one or the other yeah, just before you get into that right. i just wanted to add um alex rosenberg uh has been he's been labeled uh by other atheists a uh, mad dog naturalist Simply because he says exactly what you're saying. He says the physical facts fix the biological facts. This whole idea of consciousness of something being, um, you know, uh, some something not directly linked and controlled to the physical matter uh, or processes is from an a priori perspective ruled out. It just is, because even if, and I, I'm really glad you pointed out the, the subtle nuance, even if you happen to be a philosopher uh, and you, uh, a, a, sorry, materialistic philosopher, and you said, you know what, I'm not going to say consci consciousness doesn't exist, I'm simply going to park it. They can't even park it, because that's leaving open the possibility that their worldview is wrong. So a 
philosophically consistent materialist will have to rule it out just like Alex Rosenberg does, just like um, who's the other person that you mentioned? Um, Huxley. Huxley, exactly. Um, so basically, they'll recognize this is a serious, serious problem. Huxley doesn't rule it out. Huxley was agnostic. Actually, it's quite surprising. People don't know that. People think he's a staunch atheist. He's not. He, he's not. He's agnostic. He actually, I oh. believe, he coined the term agnosticism. Okay. Don't forget, Darwin too was not an atheist till he, he confronted the problem of consciousness. He, his daughter, from what I understand, his daughter died. Yep. And then he was faced with the problem of, of, of evil. It's a, it's a problem for a different day, okay? It's an Epicurean problem. The problem of evil. If God exists, how come evil exists, okay? He couldn't make his peace with this event. And he became, from what I understand, agnostic or atheist. I'm not even sure, okay? I don't want to comment on this, but... Uh, the reference for this is Nick Spencer's book, Darwin and God. And you're exactly right. He was an agnostic uh, near the end of his life. Is the problem of evil, which got him there, not biological science, and even when he published The Origin of Species, he was a deist at that time. He still right. believed in God. No, exactly. exactly. He actually mentions God in his book. He actually mentions God. Oh, yeah, m multiple times, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Times. Well, uh, my point being is this, okay? Listen, if you're a true atheist, if you're gonna if you're gonna go with materialist philosophy, physics and chemistry, everything is physics and chemistry, the mind, not the brain, the mind is impossible. Because it's not detected by materialist philosophy. It is not reducible to physics and chemistry. It's outside your worldview, yet it's apparent. It's first-person experience. It's undeniable. The mind, actually, is undeniable. So where, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with, how did we get mind? Yeah. See, we have the we have the fallacy of composition. Okay, so let's say, for instance, you can't say because uh, uh, the parts of a machine don't identify the whole. Okay, so for instance, let's say, let's say I have a house made of rectangular bricks. Because the bricks are composed of rectangle, because the house is composed of rectangular bricks, doesn't mean the house is rectangular. You understand? I could build you a house that's square out of rectangular bricks. Just because the parts are a certain way doesn't mean the whole is a certain way. However, there's also the problem of construction. If I build you a house out of plastic, I cannot say that this house is purely organic. Because the pieces that constructed would have to be organic for the whole to be organic. For me to have consciousness, I have to be constructed by something that had consciousness. For me to have a mind, I have to be constructed by mind. I cannot be a byproduct of something that doesn't have mind or, or consciousness. So, for instance, materialist philosophers, uh, this is a beautiful Thomas Nagel uh, argument. Okay, he wrote Mind and Cosmos, great book. An atheist, by the way. Yep. Who doesn't believe, he, he says, look, 100 years from now, we're going to laugh at, at uh, evolutionary yeah. uh, conclusions. Because he says evolution undermines not only consciousness, but reason. Because evolution, if evolution is true, listen carefully to this. It's a bit, it's a bit complicated, but a brilliant point that he makes. If evolution is true, we should just have blind instinct. We shouldn't have reason. So, for instance, you know, we move from simple to complex, right? So, let's say you're an organism. You have the instinct to eat those po poison berries. I have the instinct to not eat those poison berries. Those poison berries disgust me. For whatever reason, I'm born with this instinct. It's a happenstance according to evolution. And you have the happenstance to eat them. Well, you know what? Your instinct is wrong. You die, I live. He, Thomas Nagel says, it should just be instinct, not reason. If you do agree with reason, if you say ev evolution can create reason, then you'd have to say that evolution, uh, excuse me, reason has a fitness value. It's not a mind-independent truth. It's purely fitness value. So there is no truth. You know how we, you know, you know the argument for uh, if there's no God, there's no, there's no right and wrong. There's no ethics. Ethics is just uh, aesthetics. Well, the same is with truth. If evolution is true, ironically, truth is only a fitness value. There is no absolute truth. Yep. Yet we don't perceive truth that way. We say that truth is mind independent. There are things that are true. Whether you believe it or not, it's correspondence. No philosopher today is going to say that truth is pragmatic. Yeah. 
Truth is correspondence. So our reason flies in the face of evolution, Thomas Nagel says. He says, look, we believe in mind-independent thoughts, mind-independent truths. Yep. We believe there are no squared circles now or forever. But this is not a fitness value. This has no fitness value. It's, it's, it's an irony that evolution could not be true if the only thing that exists is evolution. It's, there's an there's a co inherent contradiction here. Truth would be a fitness value. You would believe in evolution only because it has a fitness value, not because it's actually literally true. And, and this is a beautiful point because um, some philosophers make the distinction, uh, and, and it's a very good distinction between adaptive fitness and truth fitness. So you can have a you can have traits that help you survive, but sometimes those traits that help you survive they can help you survive on totally false beliefs. Mm -hmm. So natural selection is you know if we if, if even if we want to describe it in this Platonic sense that it's, it's hovering above in some way. Um, it's not there to look at things with a T and an F, right? That's true and that's false. So I'm going to focus. It doesn't see T and F. All it simply sees is adaptive and non-adaptive. So exactly. wholly irrelevant. And I, I think that's a very interesting but point. If, if evolution was responsible for our rationality, why are we thinking on a higher plane than apparent truths? Mm. Thomas Nagel is saying, look, we think about truth as infinitely forever true beyond appearance evolution would not care about that evolution will only care about what's apparently true what's successfully true what's what's uh, what has a fitness value that's the only thing we should be interested in that's the only thing that would move forward because you might uh, you might die for your beliefs you might believe in god and you might die for your beliefs but you know what that didn't have a fitness value for you but you believed it was true independent of your mind yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, it's a it's a great point. It's hard. It's a it's a philosophical point. Thomas Nagel is a great philosopher, but it, and don't forget he's an atheist as well. Okay, and he's very intrigued with uh, different arguments about God, etc. But he says, "Look," and 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 I, and I use him because he's an atheist. Mm, yeah, because atheists could be like, "Oh, these guys are theists. That's why they believe." No, no, this is an atheist telling you, "Look, if evolution is true, there is no logic. Logic is." instinct yeah. it's an and algorithm I, yeah and i think it's worth pointing out for those of the uh me those members of the audi audience who aren't too familiar with thomas nagel we're talking about a top philosopher here we're talking about somebody that is quoted re reference that is well recognized we're not like we're not talking about some random person i mean just some random philosopher this book that for us is uh um speaking about this is published by oxford university mm -hmm. right and Nagel is somebody who, uh, Jerry Coyne, famous atheist evolutionist, uh, he has this website called Why Evolution is True, and he's usually bashing religious people alongside trying to explain evolution. He banned Nagel from his platform after that book. He said, that's it. No, 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 you, you're not going to hear about this guy here again. And he even said, and I, I, I think this is very important for the audience to uh, keep in mind, he said that, you know, the idea that natural selection uh, working on random mutations, basically the standard Darwinian story, is the explanation of the origin of life and the development of life. This is something more of a philosophical research program than it is actual science. And um, we've been brown beaten, <laughs> uh, uh, brow beaten into, uh, you know, not questioning it. And exactly. it's, it's actually something which is just accepted a priori. So I think these are very important points to mention about this book. Here's the thing, you know, philosophers were very hard to convince about anything. If you want to convince about something, you have to bring so much perfect evidence. Okay, now I want to, I want to touch upon, like, like you have to understand, I'm a staunch believer in science. Like I, I have such a love for science. I don't want to sound like I'm anti-scientific at all. Okay, uh, Ghazali, uh, 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 Alashari, they loved science. Okay, they loved proof. There's no doubt, okay? But let me give you another thought experiment to make you understand a little bit more about occasionalism, okay? A, a, a worldview that is hyper-skeptical, more skeptical than science. Because science, they look down on theologians and they say, look, you guys are just not, you're not, you're not skeptical enough. I'm telling you, look, the, the, Arab, the, the Arab philosophers of religion, 
Because I, I, al Ashari believe you have to prove God. Okay, you have to prove him logically. That's why we have kalam. Kalam is the arguments for God. You know, the Greeks didn't have kalam. Kalam is arguments for why God exists. This is a purely Arabic Muslim philosophy. Okay, this is very new to philosophy. They have kalam, a section, a philosophy that just comes from the Muslims. Okay. Imagine, let's have a thought experiment. Imagine you and me are sharing a dream. Okay, just uh, grant me this. And you're in my dream. How you got there, we don't know. We're just sharing a dream together. Khalas, you're in my dream, and we're playing baseball in this dream. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you you pitch the ball, I hit the ball, bing, and I hit a home run. You heard the sound of the bat hit the ball. You, you saw the ball travel towards me and hit me hit it in the opposite direction. You saw it fly through an arch. And you started to deduce. I remember, we're in a dream world now. You saw the ball hit the baseball, baseball bat, and or the cricket bat for you guys, or whatever you want. Okay, And you started to notice patterns and regularities in this dream. And the dream was played over and over again. And you started to realize mass equals force times acceleration. You started to realize things about inertia. You started to realize things about momentum. You started to realize about friction on the ground. You started to catch all these patterns that are being played over and over again. Yeah. And slowly over millennia, you started to realize, hey, there's these laws of physics. And I tell you, Sabur, you're right. One one. These laws are true in every, let's say we played soccer after, we played football, we played basketball, we played every sport, and you started to realize the same patterns in this dream world we lived in. Yeah. And I told you, look, uh, Sabur, these patterns and regularities you see, this, these forces are not literally out there. This is a forces from the dreamer. The dreamer is giving us these images. The baseball bat doesn't have a mass, really. Mm. These are just cor correlations. It's just one image being copied after another. These forces, weight, inertia, gravity, they are just patterns in this dream. They are not literal forces. There is only one force. Once you see the world like this, because this is truly Occam's razor, the physicists, they know the forces are never... Uh, let, let me tell you one thing, okay? And, I, and I'll take, put this and stamp it certified. Mm -hmm. Philosophers of science know very well that these forces, the forces of nature, are never observed. They're inferred by the mind. Yep. If you don't understand this, you've never read Kant. You've never understood Kant. You've never understood Ghazali, and you've never understood Al-Ashari. Yeah. All we see is one image after another. Ghazali says, you see a cotton ball, you see a flame, you bring them together, and then we see combustion. We never see a connection between the two. We just see one image after another. Now, let me tell you something. Even the most staunch atheist like David Hume agrees. They have to. Even Hume says, look, we never observe the law of nature. The law of nature is a projection of the mind. Mm -hmm. There is only one force because we cannot, here's the thing, okay? This is now you're going to start to understand a little bit more the philosophy of the Quran because I'm not a theologian. I'm a philosopher of religion, okay? The Quran is telling you there's only one force. It's actually explicit in the Quran. Allah says there is no force or power other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no, it's explicit. Yeah. When you believe in laws of physics as a bookmark, as a, a name for a pattern we recognize, I'm with you. It's a name for a pattern we recognize. If you tell me, Firas, no, it's a force out there, independent. Acting on the universe, I tell you, look, that's I, that's a projection of the mind. That's idolatry. You didn't put it in a test tube. I've never observed it. This is a projection of the mind. Now you've you've broke you've broken away from Ghazalian thinking. Okay, Ghazali's uh, Ghazali's views are more complex than that. I'll get to it in, in another day. But he says, look, it could be, it could be, Allah created a secondary force. It could be, but I don't want to go into that now. That's a di that's a different topic for another day. Uh, uh, Al Ashari says no. There's only occasionalism. It's like in a dream. If I told you, look, in the dream, you're only seeing images. You're playing a pattern. You're playing an algorithm. Let's say, for instance, here's another good example. Let's say I tell you, uh, you're, let's say you're trapped inside of a video game. And in this video game, you're playing baseball. I will tell you, look, that ball has no mass. The, the, the ball physics or is just an algorithm in a, in, a, in, a, in a tower, in a computer tower. It's just an algorithm. It's not yeah. actually a physical force in the computer game. Well, uh, Ghazali, uh, al saw, al saw the world in the same way. That's why if you look at the reverse in the Quran, the Quran is highly skeptical. 
Okay, it's, it doesn't, it, the Quran is telling you, look, don't believe in anything other than the power of Allah. These things are projection in your mind. That's why the verse in the Quran that says, if you want to see the signs of Allah, study the dunya and, with, and the with, self. And you're going to see when you study the dunya and the self, you're going to see, oh, I'm projecting these things. So for instance, and there's a verse in the Quran that says, don't you see the bird flapping its wings? None but Allah holds it up. Now the Arabs knew, the Arabs knew very well, if I take a bird and I break his wings, he can't fly no more. Yeah. So the, the, the Arabs didn't take it as, the Muslims didn't take it as Allah's holding the bird up in his, with his hand. That's not what they're saying. This is not what the Quran, no, no Arab understood it this way. They understood it as Allah is the only force in nature. Every other force is illusionary. Yeah. Now Muhammad alayhi salam, he started, by smashing our idols because we believed in these forces that were to, attributed to sticks and stones. But the Muslim has to continue on the trajectory till he strikes out every idol, including the laws of nature. There are just another idol. Chance is another idol. That's just, that's Randomness just, is another idol. Yeah. Forces of nature are another idol. They are never, and philosophers of science, the atheist philosophers of science know this very well. Read Hume. Read British empiricism. It's not yeah. just me saying this. Yeah. They admit it. They say, look, we don't we agree with you. You 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 the atheists agree with us Muslims that there are no forces of nature that are ever observed. They're yeah. conjunctured in the mind. The very few honest ones, they do. And it's such a beautiful point you made that literally everything that we call you, you know laws of nature is just like colors. You know, is your shirt really blue? Would a dog see it as blue? Would a pig see it as blue? No, color is just a projection of the mind. And, you know, if we look at the language that's being used by um, new atheists like Richard Dawkins, Neil deGrasse Tyson, they do actually refer to these things out there as if there was something, right? So when they speak about, um, like you said, uh, uh, when it comes to these particular laws, they'll start to deify them. In fact, they'll start to deify the universe. So, you know, from that perspective, there is no such thing as an atheist. There they is. are, they, they, I mean, they're not any different to the Quraysh, except for believing in Uzza, which is made of sticks and stones. They believe in the universe, but it's the same thing. What, what is nature? What is nature? They say, oh, it's nature. It's a blind process. What is this process? Can you put it in a test tube? Yeah. Is it reducible to chemistry and physics? No. It's a conjuncture of the mind. Yeah. It's like if I were to tell you, uh, what is the government? Well, you point at a building. Well, if I smash that building, is the government gone? No, you're going to be like, no, a government is a body of people with a consensus. And it's a concept. It's an emergent property. But a concept is not, is not physics and chemistry. So they're always alluding to this magic genie. I always tell them, look, I don't believe in the magic genie. I believe in Allah. It's either you believe in the magic genie. Because they're always referring to this magic something, this thing that's not reducible to chemistry and physics. Yet they yeah. say the world is only chemistry and physics. Yeah. But then they talk about a magic genie all the time. And listen, the magic genie is not me that made this up. It's Thomas Huxley's expression. He says, look, if I rub a lamp, it's like you're saying I rubbed a lamp and a genie came out. It's a, the genie is of a different nature. It's yeah. not reducible to, to chemistry and physics. So here it is. Okay, look, in the, in the story, look, this, this internal experience that you're having is a first-hand experience. Now, Ghazali said it the most beautiful. This is what Ghazali says, okay? He says, look, when I was born, I was very young. I was in a state where my senses told me something, I believed it. If I touched something that was hot, I believed it. My intellect was not developed yet. Mm. If I tasted something sweet, khalas, I believed it. As I got older, my intellect developed, the intellect usurped the authority of my senses. My senses would tell me that shadow is not moving. That shadow is still. And he said, no, my intellect would tell me that shadow is moving so slowly with the, with the movement of the sun and the movement of the earth because the sun also actually has a rotation. That's a story for another day. That shadow is moving so slowly, I don't perceive it. Mm. My intellect is telling me that my senses are wrong. Now, Ghazali says, what if something is going to usurp the intellect one day? And he says, you know what? That's, that's going to happen. He says the intuition usurps the intellect. The intuition is your first-hand experience. That cannot be wrong. Why? This is something often known as Kant's wall. Okay, Kant said, there's a wall between us and reality. 
There's H2O on the other side, and the H2O goes through that wall, i.e. our senses, and we perceive it as water. But we can, never, we can never go around the wall to go see what H2O is independently of our senses. Because if our senses were different, we would experience H2O differently. H2O, excuse me, we would experience water differently. Water is the subjective part of H2O. Yeah. It's been interpreted. H2O has been interpreted for you. You are forever trapped behind this wall. You can never experience H2O as it purely is. You understand? Yeah. So we're forever trapped. But our experience of water is direct. Yeah. Our experience of mind is direct. Now, here's the irony of it all. Here's the irony of it all. Material, what scientists believe in, material substance, concrete material substance, is mind dependent because they say in their worldview, first you have the brain and then a mind is like a steam. It's epiphenomenalism. Okay? It's a byproduct. Actually, no brain has ever been detected outside of a mind. It's actually the brain that is mind dependent. This is where Al Ashari turns the tables on us. So, for instance, let's go back to my dream experiment. Again, we're sharing a dream. Grant me this uh, dream, okay? And we're this time we're brain surgeons. Hmm. Me and you are brain surgeons, and I'm like, uh, Sabur, can you prove to me the the brain? that the mind is dependent on the brain. And you open a human being's head and you open and you said, Firas, look, if I tinker with this man's brain, he's going to start having different thoughts. So if I affect the material brain, I affect his thoughts. Therefore, his thoughts are subject to his material brain. Yeah. So what, maybe what, you think... That's all happening within my mind. It's all happening within your mind. That, but I tell you, look, Sabur, this is a, this, this brain that you're working on is also mind. Why? This is what we call a Berkeley triangle. Yeah. Berkeley says, look, think of a triangle with no subjective element. It's not green, white, blue, orange. It's only made up of objective elements. You cannot. Every triangle you dream up of, if you dream up of a triangle, it has to be black, red, white, blue. That's subjective. Yeah. And every objective element is in your head. It's mathematics. A triangle has three points. A triangle has three angles by definition. A triangle has three sides. All these are mathematical components that are projected by the mind. Yeah. They're, they're mind dependent. They need a mind to recognize them. So what's left? Color. But you just said a moment ago that color is mind dependent. Mm. So the death blow to materialism is that materialism, by the way, is only known by the mind. Yeah. So I'll tell you one thing here. Where, where does the thought of materialism occur? Look, I saw a car, I saw a boulder, I saw a tree. I said to myself, what's the essence of these three objects? They share an essence. What is it? Well, material. They're all made of something. That is a projection of the mind once again. Let me give you a for instance, okay? Berkeley said, remember Berkeley's triangle. Keep Berkeley's triangle in mind. Yeah. You see a car, you see a boulder. And you see a tree, any object, okay? You see a human being, any object in the world. Your mind makes a connection between them all and says, look, they all carry with them something. They're all built by this matter. But you never see matter in its raw form. You never see concrete matter in its raw form. All you ever know is what's experienced inside the mind. This is known in philosophy as the egocentric predicament. It's only ever known by the mind. Remember our dream experiment. The same way that you, when you operated on this person, this poor soul on the table, on your table, and you're tinkering with his brain, you're, you're altering his psyche. Well, his brain is also mind dependent. Mm. There is only everything that we know is mind dependent. There is nothing that you know that is outside of your consciousness. Um, this is a, a, a occasionalism in, in a nutshell. We see patterns in regular. If you're truly skeptical, if you're truly a skeptic, yeah, you will not, you will not accept something that is only a projection of the mind. It has to be proven without doubt. Now, what is proven without doubt? Our first person experience. And you know what's interesting, uh, and you just alluded to it here, is if you're a true skeptic, and mm -hmm. atheists are selective skeptics. They're not actually skeptics. They don't go all the way. 
they don't go all the way. I actually had an American professor um, in uh, when we were studying, I think it was epistemology, and he said, and this is the first time I actually saw this, uh, uh, you know, uh, when I was at university, th this was actually being uh, openly stated. He said, look, you know, there have been great skeptics throughout history, and he mentioned some Greek guy, then he mentioned, of course, Descartes, but then he also said, and a medieval Islamic scholar Ghazali. And I was sitting there. He only mentioned six names in the history of philosophy as skeptics. Mm. And what's interesting, um, I don't remember all of the names, but I'm pretty sure all of them were pretty much not atheists, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe he mentioned David Hume. And David Hume, there's a question mark whether he was an atheist or not. But the rest were not, from my understanding. Definitely not Ghazali and the others. So th this whole idea that, you know, if you're a skeptic, you're going to be an atheist. Actually, if you're a pure skeptic, um, you would actually, um, and if you if you want to be an atheist uh, at the same time, you'd either be inconsistent or you'd have to end up being a hard solipsist, right? Because if you really want to, like you said, begin off literally from first principles, um, you're 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 at, you're at a catch twenty two. You, you wouldn't know where to build knowledge from. I, I agree with you. That's why I, I respect Daniel Dennett to a certain degree because at least he's a, able he he's consistent to the to the fact that if materialism is true, there is no consciousness, and he denies consciousness, which is a, a self contradictory position because he's using his mind to say that the mind doesn't exist. Yeah, he's saying, look, my mind, I've conjured up an idea in my mind, and my mind is telling me that the mind doesn't exist. Why? Because he's trying to stay true to his worldview even though his mind contradicts his worldview completely. Now, I'll tell you something about the Quran. The Quran responds to this worldview. Because if you're truly a materialist and you deny Allah, Allah gives the ultimate answer in the Quran. Wallah, he gives the ultimate answer. He's saying, Daniel Dennett is denying qualia. Subjective experience is actually literally true. Now, I'm telling you subjective experience, human firsthand experience, is true. Yeah. Hold me to it later. Hold me to it. He's saying it's not true. Me and him are total opposite. Let me ask you a question. Is pain a subjective experience? He would have to say yes, because pain is not reducible to chemistry and physics. You would not know pain because a, a, a fiber in your a signal is being sent to the brain. That would be uh, reducible to physics and chemistry. A signal is being sent to the brain. You would know nothing about pain unless you feel pain. Yeah. What does God say to them in the Quran? He says, when, he sends, when, you feel, when you experience hell. Now, take this for what you used to deny. Nobody denies pain. Imagine I were to hold Daniel Dennett's hand to the fire and tell him, look, you said it's illusionary. It's not true. It's like the equivalent of him being scared of, uh, uh, of somebody dressed up as a ghost. You know, he doesn't believe in it. He would laugh at that. Well, look, it's not really a ghost. It's just a guy with a, uh, a sheet over him with two holes cut out. And he's saying, boo, it's not true. It's just fake. He should tell me that pain is fake. But nobody ever feels excruciating pain and says that's fake, that's unreal. That's the ultimate argument. Because mm -hmm. when you feel extreme pain, you're like, hey, you know what? Forget all my philosophies. Forget all my crazy syllogisms and logical arguments. This is immediate. This has, uh, it has overridden every single belief I have. I'm feeling this immediately. It has convinced me to no end that this is real. Yeah. You will never deny excruciating pain. And you know what's beautiful about your point? I mean, I, I never thought of it that way. But it just reminded me of a philosopher who's about 100 years old now. And he was an atheist throughout his life. He still is an atheist. And he used to write about how it's so irrational to fear death. How it's so irrational to worry about these types of things like, um, you know, the end of life and whatnot. And he'd publish books on this, you know, on death and these types of things. And now he's on his deathbed, he's, he's very old, he actually says, I take it all back. Because he's feeling the pain. He's feeling this idea that I'm about to enter this vortex of eternity, and I have no idea. This so is, says, everything I've written in the past about death, he just takes back. This is, this, is, this is so key. It's written in the Quran. When Allah puts them on the ship, and the ship starts to shake on them, wave on them. Wave. And all of a sudden, their masks fall. Allah, we believe in you. Oh, we're so sincere. Because you are born with a fitrah. Listen, the argument of Islam is that you are born 
with a natural religion. You're to, yeah. you're the Quran is to help you rediscover your natural religion. FYI. Yeah. Okay, we're all born Muslim. And Muslims, Islam started before Muhammad alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. Islam started with Adam alayhi salam. The Quran is a reminder for you. To, uh, Islam is a revealed but also a natural religion. The Quran says Abraham was on the truth before the scriptures. Abraham alayhi salam was upon the truth before the scriptures. Yep. I did a video for you called the Abrahamic experience. Inshallah, yep. for those of you who are interested in this, these ideas, please refer to that video. It's very key. Yep. It's, it's, the, it, it's the core of Islamic philosophy, in my opinion. Our religion is a natural one. When they're on the ship, when they're on the brink of death, all of a sudden they make shahada. Now they say, look, Allah, you are real. I see you. I, I hear you. I obey. I feel it. But their ego, once upon a time, their social environment, their bravado, their taste for uh, prestige, social status, made them deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe, listen, I believe when the plane is crashing, when the house is burning, all of a sudden you're going to revert to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's, it's your fitra. We're designed this way. And this is why I'm telling you, how was I constructed with this fitra? You know, I believe, you know, I, I, I believe Islam is what you have to return to. When you were in the womb of your mother, you didn't know anything about the ego yourself. You didn't know anything about sabur. The sabur was only developed around one year of age. In psychology, they say the ego starts to develop about one years of age. Mm -hmm. Then you, in, in the womb, you didn't know anything about the dunya. It was just you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your fitra, the sign of Allah. You were incubated with the sign of Allah. You were born upon the fitrah. All you knew was the existence of Allah, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'll tell you something. One, one statement throughout philosophical history was made by a Muslim, Avicenna. Avicenna said, there is existence. None of us can argue this. Not, listen, we can argue every point except this, this one very important point. Avicenna says, there is existence. This is a very Ghazalian point too. Okay, Ghazali touches on this. But Ghazali refused to write it down physically. He didn't want to write it down. He says in his book very, very openly, shouldn't write it down. But I'm going to give you a, a taste. He says, look, there is existence. There is no logical syllogism or argument that can defy this. I don't care if you're in a, in a matrix machine. I don't care if you're a brain in the vat. You still exist. You cannot deny existence. Now, the second we try to interpret this existence, now we're using intellect. It's possible that we're wrong. It's possible that we're right. The second we try to use a logic, this is a very Ibn Taymiyyah uh, point, okay? Whose logic do we use? The greatest logicians all disagree. Aristotle and Plato didn't agree. Schrodinger and uh, Heisenberg, Heisenberg didn't agree. The greatest mm -hmm. intellects of their time, okay, throughout the ages, Ghazali and Avicenna didn't agree. All the great intellects throughout the ages, they always disagree because logic is maybe is maybe is perfect. However, our use of logic is not perfect. We're not perfect logicians. However, Allah made it so simple for us. Existence is in your face, undeniable. Now, how many existences is there? How many? One. How many? There's only one. And existence could not have come into being. It always existed. Because if there was non-existence, it could never transform into existence. Non-existence is forever non-existent. They would have to be potential. Aristotle says they would have to be potential. Potential is existence. We cannot escape that there is existence, and we cannot escape that existence always existed. It's in your face, self priori true. Yep. We cannot escape these things that existence is one and eternal. And not only that, it is unique in category. It's one and only. There is nothing else that is like this because it is the only true objective element in the entire universe. Everything else is subjective. Me and you and every other possible argument you have, if you let me cross-examine you long enough, I will show you that it's subjective. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. This is known as the measuring stick problem. Okay, I coin it as the measuring stick problem. Suppose we're trying to measure a coast, a coastline from A to B. I believe we've talked about this before. Yeah, and yeah. I'm using a one meter stick. And I use a one meter stick. And I tell you that, look, the coast is 11 kilometers long. And then I say, Sabur, take this 12 inch ruler and measure it again. 
Now, because this ruler is more precise, it fits in the nooks and crannies a little bit better. You're going to get to this coastline is 15 meters long. I say, okay, Sabur, take this next tool, a wheel, a one meter wheel. The point of the one meter wheel, every time you do, you do a revolution, it's one meter. It's very fine and small. It fits in the nooks and crannies of the coast even more precisely. Now you're going to tell me the, the coast is 15 kilometers long. Is that 15 kilometers objective? No, it depends on the tool that you use. What measuring stick are you using? If we agree on the measuring stick, then we can agree on an objective element, an objective answer. Science is agreeing that we're going to use the human being as a measuring stick. But that is subjective. We are ultimately subjective in our conclusions. Yep. The only truly objective element, the only a tru a truly objective thing in the universe, independently objective, forever, eternally objective. This is in the book of Mishkat by Ghazali. For those of you who are interested, the only me and you and the dunya exist as information. Are you familiar with the ship of Thesis? Um, no. A ship with 99 parts? No, no, no. Okay, well. We, we, we replace each part. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ship of Thesis yep. is 99 parts. We change every day. We change one part. Yeah. You identify that ship as a ship. This has to do with essence. What, what is a human being? What makes a human being? If you change the essence of something, you change that thing. So for instance, if I have a car and I melt it down into a key, I change it. It's no longer a car. It's now a key. I use it to open doors. I use it. I made locks and keys. I, I transformed it into something else. It no longer has the essence of a car. I change its essence. I change the thing. The essence is what defines you. Yeah. When we try to discover what is the essence of a human being, it always escapes us. For further, uh, for those who are interested, look up the ship of thesis. There is no human being per se. The human being is a subjective idea. The dunya is a subjective idea. Everything is subjective. It always escapes us when we try to grasp it. The Quran says the, the dunya is a delusion. The only thing that is purely objective that when all human minds die, it's not, it's not mind-dependent. Remember, we said evolution can never bring us to mind-dependent truths. Evolution, for, for evolution, truth is only has a fitness value. Reason is a fitness value. Evolution would have to bring us to reason via blind instinct. Yeah. It would be a robotic algorithm, not true cognition. But we experience true cognition, and our true cognition tells us that everything. if you have a trained mind, Listen to this. If you have a very trained mind, if you're a true skeptic, everything is illusion, save Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah is truly objective. Only this one existing being. If you understand the surat of ikhlas from a philosophical perspective, Allah is telling you in surat ikhlas, he is the only objective thing. There is nothing else that is objective. For instance, what Allah says in the Quran, when all have perished, there will remain the face of Allah. Only Allah will exist alone. Hmm. we are subjective and at the mercy of God. How? There is only one objective thing and no, bring me the most staunch atheist. I'm going to ask him, is there existence? I don't care how skeptical he is. He cannot deny me because the second he tries to re rebuttal, he's proven my point. Now, Descartes, in my opinion, Descartes, he read Ghazali and tried to copy Ghazali to an extent and he made a blunder. He said, I think, therefore I am. I, me, Nietzsche came later back to refute him and said, you've never proven I. In philosophy, we have never proven the I. The I is subjective. The, the self yep. is known as a concept. For instance, remember we talked about earlier, if I tell you, Sabur, what is the government? Is it that building over there? Yeah. No, because if I smash that building, there's still a government. The government is an idea in the mind. It's a consensus of people who come together. It's an idea in the mind. It's mind dependent. When all human minds die, there is no more government. But Allah says when all human minds die, there's still going to be Allah. The face of Allah will still be there. Allah is mind independent. Now remember, if Thomas Nagel says, if evolution is true, there are no mind independent ideas. The Quran is telling you at least that there's something beyond evolution. Evolution may be true to a certain extent, but there is something more than evolution.
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have created the world through evolution. I don't know. I'm not an expert in evolution. I don't know the exact, what it exactly entails. However, I'll, I'll tell you that Ghazali's cosmology, Ghazali would never uh, refuse anything scientific. Ghazali would tell you, look, if there's a hard contradiction between science and Quran, this is, this is, this is Ghazali's cosmology, accepted or rejected. In my opinion, he's correct. He says, if there's a hard, how do we know what's in, what's in the Quran is metaphor or not? Ghazali takes everything in the Quran literal until there's going to be a hard contradiction between science and Quran. And then he says, that's Allah's way of telling you that this is metaphor. Because proof and Quran should never contradict. This is Ghazali's cosmology. Like it or not, this is it. He'll tell us, look, Allah is going to teach us what is metaphor in the Quran because he tells us study the dunya and study the self. Then as we study, we're going to understand the Quran more and more. Ghazali is telling you that the only objective thing in the universe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else is conjecture, idea, including the self. Allah, ex God exists in a way independent of how we exist. Mm. He's actually the only one thing we can observe that is truly 100% uh, objective. Independent of mind. Everything you show me that's objective in the universe is always mind dependent. Let me give you the ultimate quote for those of you who are skeptical. Uh, Bernard, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Russell, uh, what's his name? A very staunch atheist. Oh my God, I'm forgetting his name. Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell. He's a hardcore atheist. He says, look, I used to believe that mathematics was purely objective. Ultimate. And science is based on that. And then he said to the trained mind, after years of, spec uh, of philosophizing on, on math, he said, look, to the trained mind, math is nothing more than saying a four-legged animal is an animal. It's a tautology. Is it a, just a tautology? Is mathematics only happening in our mind? Is it mind-dependent? We don't know, philosophers don't know, if mathematics is out there in the world or in our, only inside our minds. And this has to do with a great contradiction that Hegel discovered in Kantian philosophy, which might be too much for this one episode. Mm. But Kant, Kant, one of the greatest logicians in history, made a, 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 a terrible contradiction in his work that Hegel picked up later. And basically because, it might be too complicated, but basically uh, he believed in, in the noumenal world. The noumenal world is akin to a mathematical equation, H2O. The yeah. thing that we can never go outside of our bodies to perceive. We live in the phenomenal world, the world of experience inside our heads. We live inside of our heads. There's this world out there that's stimulating us and we live inside our heads and we can never escape our heads. This is the egocentric predicament. Yeah. And he says we can never know anything about the external world, Kant says. Mm -hmm. Hegel goes around and says, hey, Emmanuel, Mr. Kant, you said that cause and effect is in our heads. So, but then you say that this world out there is causing these images in our head. Which one is it? Which one is it? With one stroke, he crippled Kant's philosophy. Because is there a world out there if cause and effect is only in our heads? There's, listen, the, the world of philosophy is a, is, a, is a back and forth argument, counter argument discussion. Mm -hmm. But one thing we know for certain what Ghazali does. He says, look, something has higher than our intellect. He says, you have to go inside the house. So, you know, he gives an analogy. Okay, what's inside this house? Well, here's level one. People can tell you what's inside the house. You can just take people's word for it. That's not good enough. You can use your intellect. You can walk around the house and look for clues. Maybe there's footprints. Maybe you're going to find some kind of clue that's going to help you conjecture what's inside the house. But that's not good enough either because you could always be wrong. And there's going to be a never-ending amount of opinions. He says, look, the best way is to go inside the house. When you go inside the house, you have a direct experience. This is intuition, first-person experience. Now, Ghazali is telling you, look, once you're hyper-skeptical, because the truth of the matter is, Ghazali was the most skeptical. He was the first one to ask the question, how do you know you're not dreaming? I'll tell you why, Sabur, you don't know why... You, I'll tell you why you think you're not dreaming right now. It's pure presupposition, prejudice. Yeah. When you, when, you know why you're, I'll tell you why you don't think you're, let's say last night you had a dream that you hit a home run. 
you wake up and we're having this podcast and I tell you, Sabur, congratulations on that home run, man. It was amazing. And you're going to be like, wait a second. I'm getting consensus now from Firas Zahabi. Wait a second. Maybe it wasn't a dream. Maybe it really happened. And then you, you finish this podcast and everybody you see keep congr- congratulating you. What a home run. And we love the way you tip the cap. And oh, wait a second. I'm getting consensus. Your belief that that dream is untrue is only because we're not giving you consensus. Yeah. But your experience was identical to the one you're having now. When you were in that dream state, you had consensus. Everybody that saw you hit that home run was telling you, bravo, what a great home run. In the dream, you have consensus. In the dream, everybody has a history. So for instance, when I saw you today on this podcast, I didn't say, hey, Sabur, you just appeared out of nowhere. No, I assume you have a history. You were once a child. Yeah. You have a mother. You have a father. You had an education. You learned to speak. You learned to dress yourself. You but I didn't see any of that. I assume it. I assume you yeah. come with a baggage of history. Yeah. In the dream, it's the same thing. In the dream, you have consensus. You have a history. It's identical to your waking state. That mm-hmm. You wake up out of that dream and now nobody's giving you consensus. So your prejudice says it's not true. My experiences were illusionary. Well, guess what? Your experiences right now are illusionary. Because just like in your dream, Ghazali says... You remember a past, you have a history, you presuppose a history. You're presupposing that that belly, that food in your belly, you ate it. It could be that you were just existing right now with memories of eating food that you never actually put in your stomach. Ghazali is saying you're presupposing a history. You're presupposing that the consensus you're getting is true. Yeah. But when you wake up out of your dream... You're in a new dream once again. You're in a new world. And again, you're getting consensus and you're forever waking up in dream after dream. But you're going to say, no, Firas, this dream has a continuity. Well, guess what? When you go to sleep tonight and you dream again, that dream has a continuity. You presuppose you've been married to this woman for 20 years. If in your dream you're being, if you're in your dream, you're married to a woman for 20 years, you're presupposing that there's continuity. It's all presupposition, Ghazali is telling you. You're not truly skeptical. You know what? You're a gullible fool because you believe in presuppositions. He says every time there's a doubt, Ghazali's definition of true is, you want me, you want me to tell you what Ghazali's definition of true yeah. is? He doesn't accept coherence theory. He doesn't accept pragma- pragmatism. Definitely doesn't accept pragmatism. He doesn't accept correspondence theory. These are all different theories of, of what is true. How do we define truth? He definitely doesn't accept justified true belief. Plato's, he yeah. would say Plato is weak, naif. Yeah. He says, I'll believe something is true when there is no doubt. I cannot be doubted. Yeah. He held the highest standard. Let me tell you something. When, when, because it, just to show you how, what, a, what a Eurocentric world we live in. When, Kant, when, excuse me, when Descartes said that 600 years later, they said, wow, this is modern philosophy. Now we started a new chapter. When Rezeli said it 600 years ago, they, just, you know, they didn't want to they didn't want to give him the, his, his, his view. And you know know what's beautiful about the point that you raised is that, you know, the Getier problem uh, in which Edmund Getier showed that justified true belief doesn't give you knowledge. Mm. That was just the 1960s. And we're talking about, you know, Imam Ghazali hundreds of years ago saying, forget justified true belief. What's interesting is justified true belief being the paradigm from which we understand knowledge was pretty much accepted from the time of the Greeks to the 1960s. Uh, he, he was more brilliant than that. He was telling the Muslims, look, don't deify Aristotle. The Muslims, some Muslims, not all. They took whatever Aristotle said as concrete. As, as, and he said, look, that's going to yeah. change over time. Like I'm telling yeah. you today, look, I accept yeah. a, a, evolution as a paradigm. I don't c- consider it literally true. I say we're working with it till 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, they're going to laugh at us. Just like we laugh at the scientists of 1,000 years ago where yeah. they thought things were concrete and true and this is never going to change. Uh, listen, uh, Isaac Newton was certain that Time is an arrow that travels in one direction. Not long after, Einstein disproved him. And look, look how well Newtonian theory worked. Amazing. So well for 200 so still, Absolutely. But here's the thing. It won't be evident to us. Maybe it's going to be evident to us next year or a thousand years from now. But in science, because we're using induction, if you understand the problem of induction or the problem of causation, which I don't think we have time to get into today, it, we never have the totality of evidence. Therefore, we're always making a generalization. Therefore, we can always be wrong. Ghazali is saying, look, guys, don't cement this because we could be wrong. And he was right because Aristotle was proven wrong later on in a, few, a number of things. Aristotle thought that things fall to earth. The heavier they are, the more they're pulled to earth. 
Galileo proved them wrong, dead wrong. No, Gal no, Galileo ran the experiments. Not only that, Europe was held hostage to Aristotle's thinking for centuries. Aristotle was, was seen as somebody you just couldn't challenge. In fact, every scientific theory was supposed to reconfirm his worldview rather than actually challenge So Ghazali would have told him, look, it's possible. It's not necessarily true concretely because there's a doubt. We don't have the totality of evidence. Ghazali is saying, look, this is mysticism, by the way. I got to tell you, Sabur, mysticism is a part of our religion. I have to, anybody who can deny it, I, I challenge any Muslim. Let's have a discussion, a friendly discussion. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a confrontational person at all. Okay? I'm not a, I don't want to be a tough guy online. I'm asking, convince me that there is not mysticism in Islam. Islam is all about mysticism. Islam is all about mysticism. I'm sorry to tell you guys, if you study the philosophy of Islam, it is all about mysticism. You just don't understand it. Most of us don't understand it. Ghazali is saying, convince me of only of the things. I'm only going to say it's true if there's zero doubt. He struck everything that had a doubt. He struck it out. What was he left with? A first person experience of the infinite God. Allah. The only truly, if you can go on this journey, you're going to have to have the courage of a, of a, of a, of a, of a I don't even know what to tell you. You have to have courage. You, you have know, to let go of every belief. You know, when you, Moses, when Allah told Moses, "Drop yeah. your staff," they, the way they, the, the interpretations are, he let go of everything. He took off his sandals and let go of everything. He let go of everything. You have, if you want to meet Allah, if you want to experience the sign of Allah, the sign of Allah directly. If you read the Mishkat of of the, the niche of lights, look, Ghazali he discusses the Quran. It's all in the Quran. So, for instance, the, the Ayat al-Nur, Allah says He's the light. What is the light? Well, consciousness is a type of light. In, there's, a, there's a type of light inside us. Yeah. The light is in a is in a is in a, a nook. The lamp, the light is inside of a lamp that's in a nook. And they say that the, the interpretation is that the nook is the chest. The heart is the the, the lamp is the heart yeah. of the believer. The lamp, if it's pure, if you're a righteous person, you reflect the light even more. This is this is tough. See, this is like uh, interpretation now, okay. Allah says, light upon light. Your, our existence is to reflect the light of Allah. Wow. We are conscious being. Materialist philosophers like Daniel Dennett, they say, look, the light doesn't exist. Why? Because it's not reducible. They want to reduce Allah to chemistry and physics. You cannot reduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to chemistry and physics, but you can witness it firsthand. You can witness Allah. Allah says he's closer to you than the air you breathe, than your jugular veins. Mm. What is closer to you? How do you know your jugular veins? You know it. it it's manifests itself in consciousness. Consciousness is closer to us. But Ghazali will tell you we are not consciousness. We are not consciousness. We are information. Human beings are just subjective information. The only observable thing that is undeniable is this thing we have within us. I shouldn't say it's beyond time and space. This thing that we are experiencing directly, Ghazali will tell you, this light, we can only reflect it. We are not this light. Mm -hmm. We can only observe it. This is the reason for your living. To observe Allah and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you observe Allah, you will want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Why do we make sujood? Ghazali says, you know, when we say Allahu Akbar, you're taking the dunya and you're throwing it behind you. There is nothing, there is no longer dunya. Let me ask you a question. What's the difference between you and sticks and stones? You and that rock? There's in this internal light. There's objects in the universe. You're an object in the universe, are you not? You're yeah. part sticks and stones. Allah, he says in the Quran that he made Adam from the earth, from clay. You're part sticks and stone. But then he breathed into him this ruh, this something transient. This transient thing is not subject to uh, physics and chemistry. So those who only observe physics and chemistry, those whose paradigm is physics, they presuppose that everything is physics and chemistry. They, can, they cannot see this light. When they see it, they say, look, it doesn't fit in our worldview. We deny it. Allah says, well, he's gonna, how is Allah going to convince them that it's true? The, the ultimate argument is they're going to feel a searing pain. Then are they going to say the searing pain is untrue? No human being will feel searing pain and say, no, my log I, I stick to my logical arguments. My yeah. logical argument, I'm such a great logician that this searing pain is untrue. It's illusionary. They won't be able to. They won't, and, and you know what's beautiful? Allah says in the Quran that those who forget Allah, Allah makes them forget themselves. SubhanAllah. That fits perfectly with what you're saying. And I just, I, I mean, when you were talking, I was remembering so many 
Like I've had experiences with non-Muslims who literally were brought up as atheists, were in houses of uh, uh, where there was no religion, yet when they came to a tribulation and trial in life, they literally just called out to God. No one came up to them and said to them, um, so, you know, this is really good argument, cosmological argument or argument from contingency. It's just instantaneous. And like Allah says that it's within you. It is within you. And that light that, you, you know, you described it in such a beautiful way. I couldn't. It's not help. me. It's the Quran. The Quran that described it. It is. It is. But the beautiful thing. And I, I think, that, you know, when you spoke about you know, Islamic mysticism or, or the essence of Islam. You know, I just wanted to share something about this, that the power of Islam, the power of Islam made an entire society, which was worshipping idols, sticks and stones, become into the leaders of humanity in a generation. Mm -hmm. And within 20 something years, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he changed the world, right? And, and we're talking about hardly any communication you know news used to take months to travel yet we with social media with all of our like we're going live stream right now because we don't have that same power and light that the sahaba had even with all of our material resources our dawah doesn't have that much impact i'll give them an even more easy challenge take any surah in the quran the shortest one Write something like it and have people around the world memorize it and recite it for generation after generation for, th for hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of years, over 1,400 years. Take the smallest surah. You write your own version, the shortest one, and make people love it so much that they'll recite it for generation after generation. You'll never write something like this. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen in history again. That's a few words are going to be on the tongue of so many people and beloved by so many people and recited by so many people. But I just want to, because I have to leave very shortly, I want to leave you with this, okay? When you make salah, when you, when you do salah, when you say Allahu Akbar, okay? Do like Khazari tells you. Throw the dunya behind you. Even the body is an object. And you have to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you throw everything behind you, remember what's the difference between you and sticks and stones. If you want an unshakable faith, your faith will never be shaken by any syllogism, any logical argument, any scientific discovery. It will never shake your faith. How are you going to know this? When you make salah and you say Allahu Akbar, throw the dunya behind you. Everything. What is? Remember this one thing. What is the difference between you and that rock? There's a light inside you. There's a something inside you. Yes? Mm. It's not known via science. It's not known via logical syllogism. When you make sujood, Ghazali tells us, you, the head, the intellect, the brain is lower than the heart. When you're in sujood, your head is lower than the heart, right? Yeah. You're saying, Allah, I thank you. I couldn't get to you with my intellect. I wasn't, I wasn't, my intellect could not encompass you, mm -hmm. but you put it in my heart. My heart is superior to my intellect. You gave me an undeniable proof. I'm thankful to you. I bow my intellect you because here's the truth. Syllogisms only can point to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't give us a taste of the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sign of Allah lives within us. When you make sujood, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gave you the answer, an undeniable answer that mm -hmm. no syllogism or scientific discovery can ever touch. Allah is not reducible to science and physics and chemistry. And Allah gave you this secret, the secret of secrets, as Al Jalani says, the secret of secrets you carry within you. The only reason Daniel Dennett can write a book about consciousness is because he knows of its very existence. He's writing about that light and he's desperately trying to tell you that that light doesn't exist because he wants us to take him as the supreme authority. But his position is self-defeating. He's telling us that the mind doesn't exist, but he's using his mind to tell us this. He is writing a book presupposing we have minds, trying to change our minds. And he's telling us that the mind has no existence whatsoever. He is in a self-defeating position. Why? Because he's presupposing materialism. If you're a true philosopher, you understand what I said, and you have no choice but to agree. Mm. This is unknowable via science and reason. Allah gave it to you as a gift. When you say, Allahu Akbar, throw away the dunya, throw away the sticks and stones, Throw away everything, what is left, this one experience. Throw away your ego, your, your, your beliefs, every, everything, what is left. Uh, Avicenna said it beautifully. He talked about the hanging man experience. Imagine you were a hanging man, and I took away your sight, your hearing, your touch, your proprioception, everything. I'm taking away every interaction you have with the dunya. What is left? 
there's still this something, this, this experience of oneness, of existence, of eternity, of power, this unknowable, truly, excuse me, this un, we couldn't do, we couldn't know it via deduction, but it can only be known directly. This one power that is eternal, undescribable, this, the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this has always existed, it's in your face, it's observable. Mm. Islamic thinkers throughout the ages who reach the highest level, they tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a sign that's observable firsthand. He didn't leave it to our intellect. God didn't leave it to our intellect. Absolutely. That's such a beautiful message to end upon. And uh, we have absolutely covered so many different topics. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, and I think before you go, and I know it's hour and a half, the audience have been going wild with comments. I mean, literally hundreds of comments, right? Yeah. Next time we go live, inshallah, we need to interact with the audience yeah. because there's been so many questions. I'm so sorry. I always interact with the audience, but I myself was mesmerized like a, a snake tamer with some of the some of the some of the things that you know brother Faraz was saying. May Allah bless you. Well, I want to be that second closing. I'm sorry, just so uh, I could be clear. I'm I'm not a theologian. Okay, just to remember, okay. Theologians they start with the premise that we believe in Allah. Philosophers of religion, we don't start with that premise. Philosophers of religion, we say we have to prove Allah, then we'll believe in Allah, okay? There's a great debate in Islam. I don't want to argue with theologians. Theologians know more than me about Islam. They understand the, the, the fiqh of Islam. They understand the history of Islam far better than me. Yep. I'm coming to Islam as a philosopher. I study all religions from the point of view of philosophy. And I want to tell you one thing, okay? In my opinion, Ghazali is correct. His philosophies were not perfect, but they were very sound and correct. Like, like all humans, he made errors. Absolutely. There's no doubt he made errors. But he was the most rational and in my opinion he fell up he's upon the truth now with that said i think he's highly misunderstood by the average muslim highly misunderstood for those of you who object to ghazali bring your objections here and let's discuss them and the other thing is you sh muslims should never ever disagree with reason or science however they should have a humble attitude that these are not absolute mm. your logic as a balance and science is never absolute we are faulty logicians and science can never give us a totality of evidence. If you do not understand the problem of induction and the problem of ca causation, you should familiarize yourself with them because Muslims were the champions of these two uh, ideas. The problem of causation is heavily influenced by Muslims. Ghazali said that if you see an arrow uh, speeding towards a target, you have no right to say it's going to reach the target. You're saying that because of prior experience, not because of reason. It's not logical. You have to say, I believe it's so because of instinct. Anyways, this is a topic for another day. We should have an episode just on the problem of causation. Ghazali was a staunch, uh, he, he understood the problem of causation heavily. Okay, okay before, before we right. get into that, there's one thing that is very much, I think the audience are going to love it. It's very much needed. I want to sit with you and go through the Joe Rogan podcast. Inshallah. One of Inshallah. Inshallah I, I would love to. I would love to actually to clarify because there was so many things like there's yeah, so many things. Yeah. And look, here, here's the thing. I, I want to say, look, I, I'm not a I'm not the perfect logician. I'm always happy to be corrected. Absolutely. But here's the thing: none of us are. Yeah. And we never have to tell tell evidence. However, Muslims should never disagree with science. We should just say, look, it's very probable, it's very possible. In time, we will know. We take a position of acceptance but agnosticism because ultimately the only thing we have 100% proof of I'm the total opposite of atheist I say the only thing I have proof of is that God exists I have no other proof of anything else everything even my own existence uh, you know uh, 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 philosophers have made me doubt my, even my own existence how do I exist I believe I only exist as information great by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I don't exist in the same way Allah, Allah is the only true existence mm -hmm. This is, again, this is a very Ghazalian point of view. Ghazali made me doubt how I exist. He mm -hmm. asked me how I know I exist, and my, all my proofs were very shaky. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but what I want to say is Muslims never say anything illogical. Mm -hmm. Irrationality will not bring you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But reason and skepticism are married. If you tell me, Firas, I know this via reason, then you had doubted it. You, you tested it. Ghazali asked for proofs. Proof and, and doubt are inseparable. If you reasoned, that means you introduce doubt. 
you asked for proof. I'm not because I doubted everything, because you know the Quran encourages us to, to reflect. Allah says in the Quran, who's more rightly guided, the seeing or the blind? The one using reason or the guy who's guessing? Blind instinct or rationale? Hmm. Right? Reason is referred to over 300 times in the Quran. Muslims used to be logicians. We have to go back to being logicians. We have to go back to being scientific. We have to go back to loving science and learning the cosmology of Imam Ghazali. And I highly recommend the book by Frank Griffel. Frank Griffel wrote a book. Uh, he's a professor in Islamic philosophy from Yale, not a Muslim, but he wrote a book on the philosophies of Ghazali. You should read it. It's a great book. It's a great summation of Ghazali's philosophies. And uh, if anybody who's interested in, in, in Ghazali should start there and then build upon, build upon this. Jazakallah khair, brother. For all brother I, I mean, uh, I, if you could stay longer, I definitely would. But I, I want to run. But, uh, so I don't want to go over time. May Allah mm. bless you. For everybody watching, apologies. We didn't interact with the audience. Inshallah, in the future, we will. Jazakallah khair, brother. Faraz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.